Thank you so much for being with us today. We are so happy that you've taken time out of your weekend to be with us and to, to ultimately get to spend some time with God. That's really why we're here. And uh, I know for so many of us, you know, church is just something that we do every week. It's just in many ways a habit that we've created, a good habit, but a habit nonetheless. And sometimes it's just good to remind ourselves that we get to be here today. We get to experience God's presence. We get to come together, grow closer to him. And, and what an awesome opportunity that is every single time we get to do it. So can we give him some praise for allowing us to do that today? Well, hey, next week we are going to be talking about um, the topic of family. We have uh, a lot of families here. We've got a lot of young families here. And, and uh, frankly, speaking from experience, I know the topic of family is something that I want to learn more about, something, you know, I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. And so um, come back next week and make sure you, you learn a little bit about that. And hey, bring some people with you. If you know some families who could use that type of teaching, please make sure you invite them to be here next week. We would appreciate that and, and think they would get something really special out of it, but I'm I'm excited for today's message, um, and and I know a lot of times I say that, and uh, I mean it every time. But today I am really excited because I think today's message is something that could really change some people's lives. Um, can I say that again? I think today could change some people's lives, could change some people's perspectives. And, and ultimately, that's what we're here to do. We want to see lives change. We want to see perspectives change so that we can accomplish some great things for God and for his kingdom. And so that's what we're going to get into today. But before we do that, um, I wanted to tell you guys uh, a quick story that um, I happened to see this week. And uh, it's actually a story that I just kind of ran across by accident. It was really happenstance. Um, I was just kind of looking on the internet, searching some stuff, and I happened to see this link, and I clicked on it, and man, it inspired me so much. It, it, like, it just gave me immediate energy, and I wanted to go and do something, and, and so I wanted to tell you guys uh, about this particular story. The title of the story um, was Johnny the Grocery Bagger. Now, I don't know why that caught my attention. I think it was just so obscure that I was kind of like, I need to check this out and see what this is about. And so I clicked the link and I read through the story. And, and this is the story that I read. It's a true story about Johnny, the grocery bagger. And he was a guy who worked at a grocery store. It was actually a pretty big company that he was a part of, but he worked at the, the local store and uh, had been hired on to just bag groceries, you know, a pretty simple task, but I guess he had done a good enough job right out of the gate that a few weeks they sent him to the company's yearly convention. Okay, so they send all of the employees to the convention. They, they want to inspire them and motivate them and, and teach them and train them. And so Johnny got to go and he got to experience this. And on the last day of the convention, the last night, this motivational speaker gets up. She wants to just light a fire under these people. And she says, she says, I don't care what you do in this company. I, I don't care what it is. You can make a difference. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what it is. You can make a difference. And this is something that hit Johnny like right in the heart. He's a grocery bagger and he's got a lady telling him you can make a difference in this company. So he's, he's motivated. He's ready to go. He gets home and he's thinking to himself, how in my position can I make a difference? How is that possible for me? And he came up with this idea. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come up with a bunch of encouraging thoughts I'm going to write them on a bunch of strips of paper. I'm going to put them in my pocket, and every customer that I serve, I'm going to slip it into a bag so that when they get home, they dump out their products, and in the bottom, they get this encouraging thought that might lift them up that day. Really cool thought, right? Now, he, he doesn't tell anybody. His manager doesn't know. His peers don't know. He writes all these up, puts them in his pocket, gets to work that Monday, and sure enough, as customers come in, he's kind of being sly about it, just putting it in there and, and letting them go and doesn't say anything about it. And the first day went by and nobody said anything, nobody noticed, nobody gave him feedback. So the next day he came back, did it again, next day did it again, just over and over and over again. Until about two weeks later, all of a sudden there was kind of an odd occurrence in the store because 
Johnny's line started to grow a little bit larger. And it got to the point to where it was so large that, that the manager came out one day and was looking and was a little confused. So he's like, well, maybe I'll step in. I'll help him out. So he goes up to this line of people, and he's trying to disperse them out, right? He, there are eight other aisles here. People, let's, you know, let's disperse. Let's get through this. This is an inconvenience for you. I apologize. And nobody moved. Now, of course, Johnny knows what's going on, so he's got a little bit of a smile on his face, and he just keeps putting those thoughts in there. Now, he sees that there's some action behind this. So he goes home, and he's like, I'm going to take this to another level. He gets his family. He gets his friends. They come to his house that night, and they go to town just writing encouraging thought after encouraging thought. The whole living room just full of strips of paper with encouraging thoughts. He comes back to work the next day, and he keeps at it. And so sure enough, the line just continues to grow. Day by day, the line continues to grow. And the manager is just lost. He has no idea what's going on. This is a problem in his eyes, right? Something's got to change. So finally one day, he goes up to this line of people. He pulls this guy aside and he says, hey, why in the world are you standing in this line? Like, like self-checkout's available. You got two items in your hand. Why in the world are you waiting in this long line? And the guy said, you seriously don't? No, I'm waiting in the line. He said, no, I'm, I'm confused. He said, Johnny, your grocery bagger, has been handing out encouraging thoughts to every customer that he serves. And I'll be darned if I'm going to come into this store and not get my encouraging thought <laughs> of the day. So, so the manager starts putting some of the pieces of the puzzle together and kind of gets a smile on his face. He pulls another customer aside. He says, ma'am, why are you in this line? Can you tell me why you're waiting in this long line? She said, I'm here for Johnny. She said, honestly, you know, normally I would come to the store every couple of weeks. She said, I've been every day for the last week to get my encouraging thoughts. She said, honestly, my, my grocery bill is skyrocketing. I don't care. I want to get that Johnny experience. So, so the manager, obviously, I mean, with like tears in his eyes, he's so happy about this. So Johnny gets off his shift that day. He pulls Johnny into his office. He says, listen, I know what you've been doing. I've talked to some customers. I figured out what's happening. He said, honestly, the only question I have is, what in the world motivated you to do this? Like, why, why would you do this? And Johnny said, well, last day of the convention, the lady said, I don't care what you're doing, you can make a difference. And I just decided to figure out if she was right or not. So the manager is just overjoyed. He said, you know what, Johnny, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to, over the next week, have you sit with every department in this store, and I want you to show them how they can make a difference. So over the next week, he meets with every department, gives some of them some really innovative ideas, like, listen to this, it's really cool. He meets with the floral department. He says, listen, if you mess up an arrangement, if a, a flower falls down, don't throw it away. Call me, give it to me. I'm going to go find an elderly couple. I'm going to give them some flowers, put it on their, their shirt so that they can have a special experience here today. Pretty cool idea, right? Um, other ideas, not so innovative. I mean, he talked to them about the importance of a smile, the importance of a, a genuine interaction and how to treat people. And would you believe within six months at this huge company, Johnny's store had become the most profitable store in the country. Within six months, he had made a difference. By the way, Johnny was a 19-year-old kid with Down syndrome, and he was the single most important employee in that company for that amount of time. You talk about making a difference. It doesn't matter what position. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You can make a difference. And as I was reading this story, again, I was just so inspired. And it just, it just led me to the topic of, of purpose. This is what I think about when I read it. It's, it's purpose because I'm telling you, if you were to go to that store, go through the experience from A to Z, you would walk out of the store and objectively look at Johnny, the grocery bagger, and say, he's got to be the least important employee in the company right? Any, anybody can do that job. He's not adding any value. It's the least important thing. And you would be wrong because he was the most important person in that company over a six-month span. And so I, I, in my inspired moment, decided to go look into the Bible and figure out how, how could this play out in our context? How could this look in our context and, and with what we do around here? And so I went to the Word of God, started doing some studying to figure out what this would look like. And by the way, the idea and the concept of purpose is all through the Bible. I mean, from beginning to end, we serve a God of purpose. Everything is on purpose. But when it comes to like the part that we play, 
right? Like, like maybe um, personalized or individualized purpose. The best example that we see in scripture is a metaphor that the apostle Paul continues to bring out in the New Testament where he likens the church, the family of God, to the body, to, to the human body. If you go through 1 Corinthians or Romans or Ephesians, you will see this metaphor come to light. And in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about how your eyes and your ears and your hands and your feet and your joints and your ligaments, how every part is important, right? Every part is equally a part of your body. Every part is important, and it all comes together to serve this wonderful purpose. It's, it's unified purpose, really, at its best. And so this is what I want to look into today. How can, how can we figure out how to have that Johnny experience through the teachings of the Apostle Paul? And so that's what I want to look at today so we can really put this into context for ourselves. So what we're going to do is we're going to read through um, a pretty good chunk of Romans chapter 12. This is one of the areas where Paul brings this to light. And we're just going to really dissect it and figure out what this means for us, okay? We want to make a difference. We want to do something in this life. So what does Paul have to say about that? So before we get into it, can we just say a quick word of prayer? Um, and, and I would encourage you to, to have your own time of prayer right now because this is something that you're really going to have to personalize for yourself. This is something that you're really going to have to to take initiative yourself. And so let's pray together that we would hear God's word. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful again for this opportunity to come into your presence. And man, just to get to worship you and get to lift you up and draw closer to you. And, And I would pray that you would open up our hearts and minds. Every single person here, everybody that can hear my voice right now, you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us today. And, and I would pray that this wouldn't just be another message. I mean, even if it inspires us, even if we learn something from it, that it wouldn't just be another message, but it would be something that we would take action with. We would, something we would move in as we leave this place, because I believe that's what you've called us to do. I pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, let's get into this. Romans 12, we're going to start in verse 1. And this is how Paul starts this chapter. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, pause button real quick. I want to talk about this for a second because we're going to dig in a little bit more. But I would contend that verse 1 really encompasses and encapsulates everything else that Paul's about to dig into. I think he starts here with the real purpose, which is that we would present our bodies a living sacrifice for God. He literally says, I I urge you, like, please do this with your life. Now, we see that a sacrifice in Scripture is something that's completely dedicated to God. It's, It's completely given to God. And so when he says a living sacrifice, he means every day with your entire life, be completely dedicated to God. That doesn't just mean in church. That means when you're on the job. That means with with your family. You're a living sacrifice to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, now that's interesting because maybe that's a different form of worship than we might typically think. Now, part of our purpose statement here says worship God. We exist to worship God. This is what we're talking about, okay? So we're not necessarily talking about raising hands and clapping and singing loud. That's great. That glorifies God. This is what we're talking about, that we would present our bodies a living sacrifice to our God, okay? So with that in mind, let's continue with no more interruptions through the rest of this. He goes on to say in verse four, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. Verse 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. And verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. 
okay? Now there is, man, there's a lot of goodness that Paul is writing on these pages. But I wanna dig into this a little bit because really the first half of what he's talking about here completely digs into the idea of purpose. I mean, this is what Paul is trying to get us to understand is this idea of purpose. And so I, I have a couple of points that I want you guys to, to really take with you today and apply to your life. And the first one is this. I need you to hear this. I need you to believe this, okay? The first point is you have an individual purpose. You, talking to you, have an individual purpose, there is not a single person that God has called that does not have a specific purpose for which they were created by God. Every single one of us. And for the record, I'm not even just talking about our collective purpose of, of worshiping him or of glorifying him. I'm talking about that God has created you with a specific set of abilities so that you can participate in and contribute to his mission. A specific individual purpose, okay? Now, this is what we read in verse 6. He said, since we have gifts, so, so Paul's assuming you have gifts, okay? So that's not up for debate. If you don't think you're that talented, you're wrong. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Not some of us, not, not, not most of us, each of us. Every one of us has a purpose and we must exercise that, Okay. Now, I mentioned 1 Corinthians 12 earlier because this is really the most robust chapter where Paul digs into the metaphor of the body. And so I would encourage you, go read 1 Corinthians 12. It's, it's some beautiful stuff when you really dig in. But in that one chapter, um, Paul points out that each of us or all of us are included in this nine different times. So, so nine different times, he specifies that we are all members of the body and therefore all have a specific purpose. He wants you to understand this concept. This is what he says in verse 11. But one in the same spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now that almost seems redundant, but he's trying to drive it in. Each one of you individually have this purpose for the benefit of the body. So again, hear me when I repeat this. You have an individual purpose. God has created you in such a way so that he can use you and, and fill a role within the body that nobody else can fill. Do you hear that? Nobody, nobody else can fill that. He created you. He's placed you to do that job. That's your calling. And I would point out that calling is not just to, to fill a seat on Sunday mornings. That's not your purpose. I guarantee you God did not create you so that you can spend one hour here each week and then just go on with the rest of your life. He's way more intentional. He's way more powerful than that. And so this is something that we have to lean into, okay? And so maybe let me put it this way and, and, and maybe this will encourage you. You have a purpose and it is important. It's, it's important, it's meaningful, it's impactful. I promise you it's, it's important. Now, I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way. But can we just be honest? Sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it's really discouraging when we don't get the results that we think we should get. And sometimes we don't feel like it's making a difference, but I promise you it's, it's important. It's making an impact. In fact, I would encourage you to go read through 1 Corinthians 12 and show me where Paul says that one part of the body is not important. Go show me where he says that, because in fact, in verse 22, he says, on the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. Necessary. So not only are you just important, but you are absolutely necessary to this whole operation that the Apostle Paul is trying to show us, okay? You're necessary. Now, I want to contextualize this a little bit, because like I said earlier, I think this is something that we really need to personalize like, this is the only way we're going to get this. This is the only way we're going to apply this if we personalize it for our context, for our group of people. And so um, I want to just talk honestly for, for a few minutes here, because when we think about this idea of purpose and how it looks like with our context here, um, one of the things that we have seen very clearly is that this group of people um, is not afraid to pitch in. Okay, we don't struggle with having a group of people that are afraid to, to jump in. That's, that's not a problem. Every one of you is ready to get your hands dirty. Okay, I, I believe that. In fact, 
our percentage of volunteers is way higher than the average church. You guys are, are ready to work. You're ready to move. However, I would say, again, being transparent, from a leadership perspective, I think we have erred in one major way. And that is we have approached this idea of serving so delicately. Like, like we don't want to ask too much of you guys. We don't want to take too much of your time. And so we kind of treat people with kid gloves as if it's not important. And so over time, what has happened because of that is, is we have learned to serve begrudgingly. It's not a joyful experience. It's not something we revel in anymore because we're treating it as a job rather than God's mission for our lives. This is something that we have to fix. This is something that we have to improve upon. And, and I'll take the blame for that. That's, that's bad leadership. But to rectify that, I want to talk about a few things today that we need to change, okay? A few things that need to shape how we move forward when it comes to this idea of purpose. And the first thing is this. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you're doing around here, whether you're cleaning bathrooms, whether you're, you're greeting people, whether you're manning a camera. I don't care what it is. You are important. You are important. It's being done for a specific purpose, for a specific reason. And catch this, it can and probably will have eternal repercussions. One conversation can change somebody's life. One smile that brings somebody back the next week who is then introduced to Christ. This is all it takes. One lesson to a child that grows up to be a leader within the church. It can, likely will have eternal repercussions. And the crazy part is more often than not, you're going to have no clue. You will have no idea the impact that you've made. You're not going to have any inclination, but you've changed somebody's life with a smile, with a comment, with a song. You've changed somebody's life. And for the record, that's just what we do here on Sundays. How about from Monday to Saturday? How about the conversations there? How about the relationships there? This is the type of purpose that we're looking for. You have a purpose and it is important. Now, I will say this, that doesn't mean that it's not gonna be a grind sometimes. <laughs> I guarantee anybody who has served consistently will tell you that it can be a grind. It's not always gonna be super exciting. It's not always gonna be super successful even. But how about this? What if this was our perspective? What if every time we stepped into our purpose, we just assumed that we're changing somebody's life. What if every time we stepped into it, we're here to give somebody hope. We're here to give somebody a new perspective. We're here to encourage somebody with what they might be going through. We're going to change somebody's life today. Now, again, I'm going to be here next week, this time next week. I'm going to be back in this room over here, which is called our loft room. It's kids 7 to 12. I'm going to be back there teaching our children. And, and when I say teaching, I mean wrangling children so that they don't run around and yell. And I'll be honest with you, most times I get done with that and I think to myself, I did nothing. <laughs> I absolutely made no impact. And it can be discouraging until I saw one little girl run out of the room one Sunday, run up to her mother and say, I have to be back next week. I have to be in this class next week. I will be back there every freaking Sunday if that's what it takes. <laughs> one life, one perspective, that's all that it takes. What if we assume today I'm changing somebody's life? Is that something you want to be a part of? Is that something that you want to do? You have a purpose. It is important. Move in it. Act in it. Live within it. Because here's the other thing, and this is actually my second point today. We need you to fulfill your individual purpose. Listen to me. We need you to fulfill your individual purpose. Around here, we call this getting in the game. And we need you to get in the game with us. We need you. Paul said it is necessary. It's necessary. So let's go back to verse 5 because this is where Paul really gets into this topic of putting purpose into action. And so this is something that I want us to understand. So let's read verse 5 again. He said, so we who are many 
are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So let's stop here for a second because we do see individual purpose within this, but then we see that we're, we're working together to accomplish this. Individually members one of another. Another translation says individually belonging to one another. Isn't that cool? We belong to one another. So this is, a, this is a team effort. You're not doing this by yourself. You're not doing this for yourself. This is a, a team effort. And listen, we need you. We need you. Now, this is what he goes on to say in verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. So you have a purpose, and Paul is telling you, you have to exercise this. You have to use this. You have to practice this. You have to sharpen this. This is what purpose looks like. Now, if God created you with all of these specific talents and, and, and abilities and all of these strengths, and yet you go on to live your life without putting any of that into practice, what does that even mean? I don't even know what to do with that. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for what God wants to do? And what does that mean for us who need you? And so again, let me try to, to personalize this a little bit so you can really understand what that means for us in this context, okay? So listen, our desire as a church is to be healthy, to be thriving, and to be growing. These are three things that I pray for this church every single morning, that we would be healthy, that we would be thriving, that we would be growing healthy, and that we are growing closer and closer to God and looking more and more like him. Thriving and that we have energy and passion and, and movement growing and that lost people are being saved and hurt people are being healed, like healthy, thriving, and growing. Now listen to me, that is simply not possible without you discovering and fulfilling your purpose. We will not fulfill our purpose as a church if you do not fulfill your purpose as a member of it. That's how this works. This is what Paul is trying to show us. So listen to me, we are not gonna be healthy, thriving, and growing on the work of one person or the work of two people or the work of 50% of us. Each one of us, he says nine different times, each one of us must seriously and diligently play our God-given part. So listen when I say this, this is as much your church as it is my church. It is as much my church as it is your church. We must do this together and be diligent about seeing God's purpose done in this community. Now, I want to show you how much Paul leans into this idea of, of a whole body working together. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, this is a whole different letter now, and yet he continues to lean into the same premise. He says, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So the whole body and the working of every individual part is how the body grows. Now, if you were, interestingly enough, if you were to take out kind of the non-essential clauses of this sentence, verse 16 would say this, from whom the whole body causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself. In other words, the focus is on the whole body. That's the only way it's going to grow is if the whole body is working together to accomplish growth, okay? This is what he says elsewhere, Colossians 2.19. The entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and the ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. The entire body, every joint, every ligament, every body part, every member, you're all essential, you're all necessary for growth, okay? So, so catch this. If you are not currently using your gifts for the benefit of the body. If you are not exercising your purpose for the growth of the church, I would encourage you to change that. I would urge you to change that. Be serious. If this is why you were created, if this is why God made you, you better be serious about it. And so every Saturday, we have a class here called Activate where you can go take some assessments, better under your, understand yourself, find out what your strengths and weaknesses are, and maybe figure out how you can fit 
into the church. If you have not done that, sign up for that right now. Sign up for that today so that you can be a part of that and take that step. If you've done that, then, then go talk to one of our ministry leaders. Like, go ask them where they need help. I promise you, they will take you up on that. Go ask where you can fit in and, and what role you can play to help benefit the body. Here's another good um, thing that you can do. You can talk to your family and friends, the people that you know best, and ask them, what are my strengths? Like, what, what, what am I really good at, and how might that fit into the church? You're probably going to get better feedback than you can give yourself because you got some blind spots, right? So, so do that, or if nothing else, do something. Step into something. Do, do something. Take action and move forward so that you can begin to understand what sustained purpose might look like for you, okay? God has created you, and he's positioned you for a reason. So don't take that lightly. Don't take that for granted. Let's come together and make a difference, okay? Let's come together. And in fact, this is my final point. We must do this together. We must do this together, okay? So lean into this for a second because I think this is really, really important. I, I just used the, the phrase sustainable purpose, which is really, really important because you're going to come across some hard times. You're going to hit some hurdles. You need to have sustainable purpose. This is how you accomplish that, okay? So this is what Paul says, and man, he leans into this with everything he's got. And I want you to think about all of these things that he's pointing out. Starting in verse 10, he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be devoted. Give preference to one another in honor. In other words, it's not always about you. Don't, don't make it about you. Give preference to other people because it needs to be a team effort. Not lagging behind in diligence. Be diligent. Be fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. This is important. We need to understand why we're doing it, who we're doing it for at all times. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. In other words, when, when there's something to celebrate, man, celebrate. Go have some fun. Party with some people. Like celebrate when it's the time to celebrate. And when somebody's hurting, get down in the mud with them. Empathize with them. Try to, to pick them up. This is what we must do. He says, be of the same mind toward one another. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. He, he just is digging into this idea of togetherness and, and of, of teamwork. And actually, next week, we're going to talk about family. The following week, we're going to talk about togetherness, what that really means, what that really looks like, what the impact of that is. So next two weeks, make sure you're here. I promise it'll be worth it. But the reason I think it's important to talk about this within our context today is because hear me when I say this, and I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have already experienced this, but Discovering and fulfilling your purpose is not an easy endeavor. So let's set the expectations right now. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that, you know, you can take a two-step process starting tomorrow and it's going to carry you through the rest of life. It's difficult. It can be confusing. It can be frustrating. In fact, we heard a couple of weeks ago a leadership lesson where the pastor said, in America... 87% of the church is not actively fulfilling their purpose. 87%. Like that's not just the majority. That is the vast majority of us who are not actively fulfilling our purpose. Why? Because it's, it's not easy. It's, it's not an easy thing. Sometimes we struggle with grasping what our purpose is. Sometimes we struggle with where we fit in. And, and really most often we we aren't willing to put in the work that's necessary to fulfill that purpose. Like if we're just being honest with it, it's, it's difficult. In fact, even the Apostle Paul, who I feel like I talk about nonstop, which isn't a problem to me, but he, he as, as unbelievable as he was, he makes comments like this. I press on toward the goal of my upward calling. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Like this can be a battle that you have to fight for, that you have to press toward which is why it's important to remember we must do this together. We must do it together. In fact, I would go so far as to say if you feel like you are just worn out, 
When it comes to your purpose, like, man, I am just worn so thin, I'm going to lose my mind at any moment, I would tell you that it's because you're not doing it with other people. You're not getting the help that you need. You don't have anybody in the trenches with you. You're trying to do it alone. And God tells us over and over again in his word, man is not meant to be alone. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Iron sharpens iron. He's trying to say, you have to do this together, guys. You have to do it together. And this is why Paul just continuously brings up this metaphor of the body, because when you really think about it, the human body is, is maybe the best example of, of, of purpose and unity. Just think about it for a second. There are thousands of things happening in my body right now to allow me to take another breath. Thousands of things that are ensuring that blood continues to run through my veins and oxygen makes its way to my lungs. Thousands of things happening by individual parts working together so that I can live. Unified purpose. This is what the church must look like. Where we understand that we all have a role to play. We understand that it's important, that it's necessary. And then we come together to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. Unified purpose. So you have a purpose We need you to fulfill that purpose. So let's come together and get it done.